We stopped right in the middle of Banach's fixed point theorem. Um, uh, no, in the middle of the proof of the theorem. Huh? But maybe we just, uh, to remember, look at the theorem first. It's a really fundamental and very important theorem for uh, large parts of numerics. Whenever you have uh, an iteration process and you want to prove that the iteration converges, um, oh, yeah, fixed point iteration, uh, process, then uh, this theorem can be applied and what we need to know is basically only that our function is a contraction. That's the assumption here. And then if f is a contraction, then we get a unique fixed point. Uh, we get convergence of fixed point iteration and even more we get an error bound, um, we get an upper bound for the error after k iteration steps. Yeah? And this is, this is the formula. This is a general formula and this formula tells me that, I mean, whenever I want to know, um, whenever I want to know the error after k steps, I can get it. That's what you see here. If I have done L plus one iteration steps, no matter what L is, L may, may be one, it may be 1000, it doesn't matter. After some number of steps, this formula tells me that after k steps, so maybe L is equal to 1000 and K is equal to 2000. So after 1000 steps, this formula tells me how far am I away after 2000 steps from the fixed point. Okay, and now we can, we can uh, derive, easily derive special variants of this formula. For example, for L equals zero. That means when I'm right at the start of our iteration here, the formula tells me how far are we away from the fixed point after k steps. And this, the other special case is L equal k minus one. That means after k steps, so that's actually after I finish my iteration, this formula tells me how far away is the fixed point right now. Okay, that's what the Banach fixed point theorem uh, um, tells us. And we started, yeah, actually we, we proved what we have here on this slide. So first, and this is the basic core of all the proofs of, of such a fixed point theorem. I mean, what we did here was actually we performed a number of iteration steps, actually k minus l iteration steps. Um, yeah, we can start after l iterations and then apply k minus l further iteration steps, and then we have this um, difference. And look, what's interesting here, this is the difference between two successive iterations. Huh? Um, and this, this distance between two successive iterations decreases per iteration steps, step by a factor of L. And this capital L is our Lipschitz constant. And the Lipschitz constant um, is related to the first derivative in the region around the fixed point. And what did we do here? Starting from here, first you see we apply our fixed point iteration uh, algorithm. f of xk is xk plus 1, f of xk minus 1 is xk. That's what we did here. And now here, 
I mean, this is basic, you immediately see it, we apply the contraction condition for our function f. If f is contracting, then such an inequality holds for all pairs of numbers x and y. And if it holds for all um, numbers, then of course it also holds for x k and x k minus 1. These two steps are here being applied iteratively, k minus l times, and that's how we get from this to this. And now this basic result, that's what we have applied here. Um, yeah, we applied it here a couple of times and derived what we, what we got here. Um, and this is actually our error estimation. This is our error estimation. Yeah, for the, um, yeah, this is for the a priori estimate. Or is it, oh no, sorry, sorry, oh no. This is almost the error estimation. What's different here? I mean, here we have x, x1 minus x0, but here we have xk plus m minus xk. But we, we need more. Um, here, look. We need to have here not xk plus m, but s, the fixed point. So there is some, uh, there is a part of the proof missing. I just omitted this here. Uh, so we have, to, we have to take here the limit for m towards infinity and then we, could, we would get s here. Okay, yeah. I mean what we basically did here is we proved that our um, fixed point iteration is, is a Cauchy sequence and because in the real numbers every Cauchy sequence uh, converges we have proven that the iteration converges. Um, okay, but let's look back to the theorem. That's not enough. We, now, up to now, we only have proven that the iteration is convergent. But, um, we, well, what's missing is we have to show that it converges to the fixed point. That's missing. It may converge to something. And also, we, uh, what's missing is that f has a unique fixed point. Yeah? So, I mean, we will prove that our iteration converges to a fixed point. And with this, we have, we have also proven that there is a fixed point. I mean, the, the reasoning is the following. We take our assumption f is contracting, then we prove that um, our fixed point iteration converges, then we prove that it converges to a fixed point. So that means if f is contracting, then of course there is a fixed point because our iteration converges to a fixed point. If it converges to a fixed point, of course there has to be a fixed point. Okay, and then what's missing is, is this fixed point unique? Or maybe there is a second fixed point. And uh, that's what I will show now. Okay, yes. Um, so, suppose this S is some number which is the limit of our converging sequence, of our iteration sequence. Yeah? And now we will show that uh, this limit is actually a fixed point. Okay, so let's start uh, applying f to s and what we have to show is that f of s is equal to s. That's what we have to show. Okay, so now f of s, and s is this limit, 
So f is f of s is f of the limit of our sequence. And now we can exchange the application of f and the limit. So we can write this is equal to the limit of f of xn. Why can we do this step? This step is not always allowed. What is the assumption for this step? First and second, does this assumption hold? We know that S is uh, the same like F of S. And then we can oh no, that's what we want to prove. We want to show that F of S is equal to S. Because f of s equal s, that's the proposition we want to prove, which means s is a fixed point. No, no, we, we are not allowed to assume this. Under which assumption can I swap limit and function application? Yeah, that's the continuity of the function f. Whenever a function is continuous, then we can exchange limit and function up, uh, application. Okay, yeah. So here we have to assume f is continuous. And now, is f continuous? Stetig. Maybe sometimes I should uh, translate some words to German because it, it uh, pretty often happens that uh, German students ask me, is diese Funktion kontinuierlich? We normally say stetig in German. Huh? Okay, now, uh, is f continuous? So what do you think? Now raise your hand if you believe f is continuous. Who would believe that? Okay, who would believe f is not continuous? Who would believe I don't know? <laughs> okay, at least that's honest, yes. Um, f is continuous. But why? Why is f continuous? f is continuous, yes? Um, is, um, we know that it's a contraction. Yes. So that's why it's continuous. Yes, perfect. Uh, but of course now you have to go to the blackboard and prove that any contracting function is continuous. <laughs> you want to do that? With a sheet of paper, I can. With, ah, so not with the blackboard, but with the sheet. Oh, you have the proof uh, here. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Oh, was that was it an exercise or? Uh, I guess yeah. Maybe it's an exercise in this chapter. Yeah. Okay. So okay, we don't we don't talk about this proof because it's an exercise for you. Huh? Um, and it's, it's actually, it's not, it's not a hard exercise, it's quite easy. You just have to look at the definition of contracting, which is, I mean, basically such an equation with the Lipschitz constant. Uh, and from this you can, yeah, if you have a, a decent look at this inequality, then you will see it. But that's, that's what all mathematicians say all the time. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, where are we now? Oh, we are here. 
Okay, so we are allowed to do this because f is continuous. Oh yes, and uh, maybe you should, uh, I should mention the following. So what's quite interesting is, uh, for our Banach fixed point theorem, we do not assume that f is continuous. We do not assume that f is differentiable. We only assume that f is a contraction. And what's quite interesting is that this contraction condition is something in between continuous and differentiable. It's more than continuous because every contracting function is continuous, uh, but not every continuous function is contracting. Um, and also we have already seen that there are functions which are uh, contracting but not, con uh, not differentiable. Uh? So differentiable is stronger than contracting and contracting is stronger than continuous. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's continue here. So we are now here. Um, we have the limit of f of xn and now f of xn, um, this gives us xn plus 1, which is the next iterative res uh, result. Um, and now we have the limit for n towards infinity of xn plus 1 and this, of course, is x, uh, sorry, is s, is s. That's what we had here. And now we are finished and we have shown f of s is equal to s. And that means our limit is a fixed point of f. Okay. Um, and now we have to show that this fixed point is unique. And the typical way to prove that a number is unique is we assume there are two numbers with this property, but then we show they have to be the same. Okay, so we assume that we have two fixed points, S1 and S2. And for both of them we have the fixed point equation. And now we, uh, we look at the difference S1 minus S2 um, and the absolute value of this and S1 minus S2 is of course f of S1 minus f of, f of S2. Why? Because they are fixed points. And now again we apply our uh, contraction condition, so this is less than or equal to L times S1 minus S2, absolutely. And now uh, we just look at. Na, jetzt mag er wieder nicht. Okay, sorry. So suppose this is underlined and this is underlined. And now look at this inequality. And because of this, S1 is, A is equal to S2. Why? How about this inequality? x is less than L times x and L is 
some number which is not zero. Can you give me a number that's equal to five times that number? Yes, of course, zero. And that's the only one. And that's why S1 minus S2 has to be zero. And if this difference is zero, then of course these guys have to be equal. Yeah. Oh no, sorry. Uh, so this is for L equal 5 for positive numbers that would be trivial. So I mean because this is an inequality um, now here it's important that L is smaller than 1. Uh? So the number is smaller than 0.5 times its number, this number for example and that's how to find such a number, except zero. Okay, so now we have proven one and two and uh, three is missing. But you can find this in books. Okay, let's apply our Banach fixed point theorem. Now this, uh, this function is well known to you. It is um, the, the function f, uh, if we apply this, then um, the, the iteration will converge to the square root of this number a. Now if we take a equal 5, then this should converge to the square root of 5. And we use as an initial value x0 equal 2. Um, and we know, we have already shown, that this f is contracting on some interval depending on a and for a equal 5, uh, 2 is a good left bound. That's what we have proven already. And we get a Lipschitz constant of 0.5 with this interval. Okay, yeah. And now we can apply, for example, the a posteriori uh, estimation for our um, cutoff error. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, if we do this on the left hand side, we have s minus xk and s is square root of 5. So the distance between our iteration and, uh, <coughs> and the limit is less than l divided by 1 minus l times xk minus xk minus 1. And as you can see here, for L equal 0.5, this is 1. So you see, I mean, that's, that's quite a nice property. Whenever L is 0.5, then the difference between two successive iterations is equal to the distance from the fixed point. And that's quite nice. Let's look at this iteration table. Here we have our iterations xn and um, let's give it another try. Sorry. For example the difference between these two guys is what we have here. Yeah. So this is x4 minus x3 and because of this inequality we know that the error is less than or equal to this number. So this is an error bound. This is an error bound after four steps. This is an error bound after three steps, two, one. Yeah, um, yeah. so after four steps our a posteriori estimate is exactly this number. If we would use the uh, a priori estimate, we would get this number. And you see there is quite a big difference. I mean, that's what I told you last week. When my kids ask in Ravensburg how long will it take, my estimate will not be as good as if they would ask me five minutes before we reach the goal. 
And that's what you see here. I mean, here you, we have a very accurate estimate of our fixed point, and here it's not so good. Okay. Yeah, and let me again mention that our Banach fixed point theorem gives us an error estimation without knowing the limit. I mean, that's of course very important because, I mean, if we would know the limit, we would not apply fixed point iteration if we would know it in advance. Okay, now let's look at, an, at a different example. We now take the exponential function of minus x and uh, look at the fixed point equation. Um, the picture looks like that. This is our negative exponential and this is our straight line and here we have a fixed point. Um, yeah. Okay. And the first thing, of course, again, is to find a Lipschitz constant. Huh? That means we have to find an interval in which f is contracting and um, we want to have a Lipschitz constant which is as small as possible. That's very important. Yeah, maybe we should go back to the theorem. Um, look at, um, let's look at the a priori estimation. Assume for a moment we would have L equal 1. Then here the denominator would be 0. Um, uh, or let's take a very small L, uh, sorry, an L which is close to 1. Uh, then the denominator is extremely small and this, go and this goes to infinity. That means we get a very bad uh, estimate for L close to 1. And why do we get a bad estimate? Because our iteration is extremely slow. So it would ex take extremely much time to converge if L goes towards 0, as uh, towards 1. Yeah? Um, on the other hand, if L is very small, goes to 0, then we can neglect this here. And uh, this is a very small number. So for a fixed number of iteration steps, k, we get an extremely good estimate. So you see, we get fast convergence if L is small. Um, yes. And actually in this example here, in this example, I mean, we had L equal 0.5. But we could have gotten a much better L. Let's look at the picture. Let's go back to this example again. In this example, the graph looks like that. Um, something like that. Ah, a little bit different. This slope here is smaller. Like that. Yeah. And this is not correct either. This is the situation. And here at, at the fixed point, the slope is horizontal. I mean, you, that, that's, that's not hard to prove. Huh? But for this example, this is the case. And what we did is, we found an interval from some point here to infinity and how did we how did we find this interval we looked for a point where the slope um, the slope here is minus one half that's how we found this point we could find an even better interval where for example um, the slope here would be 0.1 or 0.01 because we have a horizontal tangent here. I mean, this is a special case. But in this special case, 
we have extremely fast convergence. Yeah? And why? Because the tangent here is very small. And this is also inti intuitively um, easy to understand. Suppose we start here with our x0. Now look what happens. We go horizontally to this line. Then we go back down here. And now look what happens. The tangent is almost zero here. So that means this horizontal line throws us very, very close to the fixed point. And that's why the number of steps we need is so small. We have extremely fast convergence here. So that's important that the smaller our Lipschitz constant is, the faster is our convergence. Um, and now look, what you also should learn from this example is, you should always try as a starting interval to find as small an interval as possible. Uh, the smaller your interval is, the smaller the minimum of the first derivative of the function will be. Look here, if I increase the interval, the, the minimum, uh, uh, sorry, not the minimum, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I, maybe I need some Christmas holiday. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm talking about the maximum of the first derivative, sorry. Huh? Um, the bigger your interval gets, your maximum can only become bigger if the interval increases. Or if you make the interval smaller, then this maximum of the first derivative may only um, get smaller. That's why you should try to find an interval which is as small as possible around the fixed point. Okay, and that's what we should do here in this example. Yeah. Now let's look at such a picture. Okay, so this is e to the power minus x. And the slope here is minus 1. Um, and uh, we have this function x here, and this is the fixed point. Okay, now what we can do here is we take our tangent here, which of course is below our exponential function. And now what is this yellow intersection? Where is this? Of course it's to the left of the fixed point. Yeah? And where is it? What is this point? This is one, of course. One. Okay, so this is one half. Um, yeah, and that's why, and, and, and you see what's nice is this point is to the left of the fixed point and it is very close to the fixed point. So what we do is we take this point as the left margin of our interval. How about the right margin? We don't need one. Why? Yes, that's it. Because the slope is just dis decreasing, the absolute value of the slope is just decreasing. So this is on the, uh, or let's, let's, let's uh, say it like that, e to the minus x. And the first derivative of this function um, 
the absolute value of the first derivative of this function has its maximum on the left margin, right on the left margin. So we only have to compute the derivative here and that's it. And that's why here on the slide we uh, I mean, here we write L is the maximum of the absolute value of the first derivative, which is the maximum of minus e to the power minus x. Uh, because this is the derivative, and the absolute value of minus is plus, and that's why we take uh, e power minus 0.5. And why do we use 0.5? Because we have, we found an interval uh, where the fixed point is to the right of the interval and it's close to the fixed point. Okay, and this gives us 0 0.6065. And that's our Lipschitz constant. Okay, and now for this example, as you can see, there is no big difference between the slope here and the slope here. That would be only a tiny difference. And this means that this is a very good Lipschitz constant, what we got here. Uh, so this gives us very good information about our con convergence speed. On the other hand, if we would take as, as the left bound, let's say, some value here, that wouldn't give such a good es estimate. Okay, now let's, let's first look at this table. This is the table of our fixed point iteration steps. And you immediately see a difference to what we had before. What we see here immediately is that our convergence is much slower, much slower. Look at the old table here. After four steps, we, uh, so many digits up to this point were fixed. No, up to here were fixed. This was the only digit that was moving anymore after four steps. So we had two, four, six, eight, nine fixed digits after three steps. After three steps, we had nine correct digits. Now look, what do we have after three steps here? One digit. Huh? And um, after 22 steps, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So after 21 steps, we have 6 fixed digits. Yeah? So it's much slower convergence. And the reason is that the first derivative at the fixed point is far from 0. It's around 0.6. Okay, now here we have the a priori estimation formula. And now with this formula, this formula can give me an estimate for the error after a fixed given number of steps. I mean, it's nice to know this, but most of the time the question is different. Most of the time, um, I want to find this fixed point to a given accuracy. So the accuracy is given, I want to know it maybe to uh, six decimal places. 10 to the power minus 6 should be my, the accuracy of my fixed point. And the question is, how many steps does this take me? Now look at this formula. We can do this. Because now, this is given. I know this must be 10 to the power minus 6. This is given, this is given, and L is given. The only unknown is K. So we just have to solve this inequality for K. Now, if I do this, that's what, what I get. Uh, you can do it at home. This epsilon here is S minus XK. S minus XK has to be uh, less than or equal to epsilon. So we replace this by epsilon, solve it for k, and that's what we get. And now if we, 
if we substitute everything, epsilon equal 10, uh, 10 power minus 6, L equal 0 0.606, x1 and x0 as these, then we get 22.3. That means we need at least 22.3 steps uh, to get an accuracy of six digits. And look here, we have two, four, six digits here. Yeah? So after 20 steps, we have six, six digits. So our estimate is correct. Excuse me? Yeah? But how can you compare these two examples? Because those two examples have different functions, really. What? Convergence always depends on the function too. Yes. Here the function is e power x, e power yeah. minus x, and in that we have a different function. Yes. How come you are comparing both the cases? Oh, how can I not compare them? Convergence just depends on the value of Yes, the uh, of course, convergence depends on the function. And that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I mean, for the one function it converges fast, and for the other function not so fast. Why is that a problem? L, yeah. You are concerned about L. Yeah. And why do you need to compare these two functions? Because we could have uh, infinite number of functions which depend on convergence, which could have different conversions. Yes, I mean we have two different functions, and because we have two different functions, we get different L's. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay, and I mean, uh, what we also could do is uh, calculate the a priori estimate, which gives us 1.7 times 10 power minus 4, and the a posteriori estimate, look, this is almost exactly a factor of 2 better than this. Yeah? It is uh, always better. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so much about uh, Banach's fixed point theorem and its application. Um, yeah, now I want to look at the conversion speed a little bit closer. We know already that conversion speed via the Lipschitz constant is somehow related to the first derivative at or around the fixed point. And we will look at this now again. First we define such a number epsilon k. We call this the cutoff error, which is the error we have when we stop our iteration after k steps. Huh? So it's xk minus s. Huh? Um, and now again, I mean this is the, the, the same boring game all the time. Epsilon k plus 1 is xk plus 1 minus s, and this is f of xk minus f of s. Now we apply the contraction, which is less than or equal to L times xk minus s, and xk minus s is epsilon k. And now see, uh, you see epsilon k plus 1 is less than or equal to L times epsilon k. So you see, L is the contraction factor. Huh? If L is 0.1, for example, then uh, from one step to the next, the error decreases by a factor of 10. Huh? If L is 0.5, then it decreases by a factor of point, uh, point 0.5. And if L is 0.99, then it there is almost no decrease. It's only by a factor of 0.99. Okay, yeah. And now we have this nice theorem. Um, if, so we have such a contracting function. I mean this, this just means f is a contraction. Maybe you should replace this and say if f is a contracting function. 
And now, yes, of course, it has to be continuously differentiable because we talk about the first derivative. And we know the first derivative, um, which is not allowed to be zero in the whole interval. That's important. First derivative may not be zero in the whole interval. That, for example, means that to our first example, we cannot apply this here. No? This does apply to the second, to the exponential function, but not to the first example. And if this holds, then the ratio epsilon k plus 1 over epsilon k is equal to the first derivative at the fixed point for k towards infinity. So now we have it. Uh, yeah written down black on white that the first derivative at the fixed point determines our convergence speed um, for k towards infinity. This ratio is the convergence speed because it tells us, it gives us a factor by which the error increases from one step to the next. Is that clear? That's important here. Okay, yeah, and the proof of this, it's not really difficult. It is actually much easier than the proof of the, our next theorem. It's a special, an easy special case of the next proof. So you should be able to do it as an exercise. But let's then look at our next theorem. Okay, but some conclusions from this uh, theorem. I mean, now we could we could solve this equation. We, um, we neglect this limit for a moment. And we bring this epsilon k to the right hand side, then we could say epsilon k plus 1 is some factor, this is a constant factor, does not depend on k, times epsilon k. And that's what we have here. Epsilon k plus 1 is a constant factor times epsilon k. With the constant is equal to the first derivative at the fixed point. And because this right hand side is a linear function, we call such a process linearly convergent. Uh, this is a linear convergence uh, with the convergence rate q. Okay, and if I don't do just one step, I do one uh, m iteration steps, then um, we get epsilon k plus m. And my question is, how big must such an m be? How many steps does it take me to get one digit in uh, extra precision? One digit means that this new error must be at one-tenth of the old error. Okay, and now we write epsilon k plus m is approximately equal to q power m times epsilon k, yeah? because each one step gives me a factor of q. So, uh, so m steps give me a factor of q power m. So q power m epsilon k is equal to 10 power minus 1 epsilon k, so we can uh, cancel out these epsilon k's and we get q power m is 10 power minus 1 and now we take the logarithm, so we get m uh, times the logarithm um, of q which then is less than or equal to minus 1 if we take the logarithm to the ba to base 10 and so we get m is greater than or equal to this number. Now if we look at uh, tabular of this function then for I mean if I know our, our uh, the absolute value of the first derivative here then the number of steps it takes me to get an additional digit, if the derivative is 0.3, it takes me two steps. If it's 0.56, four steps. If it's 0.972, we get 80 steps. And uh, I mean, of course, 
This goes to infinity as the first derivative uh, goes to 1. Uh, why? Look here. Then q approaches 1 and the log of 1 is 0. And so it goes to infinity. Okay, yeah. And now comes the next theorem, which tells us what happens in our square root example. So in this example, for this function, remember we had this picture with the horizontal tangent. And that's what our next theorem is about. Let f be contracting with first derivative at the fixed point is equal to zero. And uh, in the whole interval the second derivative is not allowed to be zero. I mean that's similar to what we had before. Before um, the first derivative was not allowed to be zero. Now the first derivative is zero, but the second derivative is not allowed to be zero. Because if the second derivative would be zero also, then convergence would be even faster. So the more derivatives are zero of our function, the faster is our convergence. I mean, that's intuitively easy to understand. What is a function with all derivatives zero? We are talking about fixed points. This is our straight line. A function with all derivatives zero is a constant function. Now start fixed point iteration with a constant function. We start here with x zero, we go up to the function and that's it. One step and we have the fixed point. So if all derivatives are zero, it always takes me one step. Uh? And the more derivatives are zero, the faster it is. Uh? And, uh, but of course, I mean, this is very rare. There are no many no, not many functions with all derivatives uh, zero. Uh, um, so now let's talk about this class of functions where the first derivative is zero, but the second is not zero. Uh? And the second derivative has to be continuous in our interval. And then we get this, what means quadratic convergence. Huh? Why is this quadratic convergence? Look here, if we neglect the, uh, the limit and we bring this epsilon k squared to the right hand side, we have epsilon k plus 1 is approximately a constant times epsilon k squared. Uh, and because of this square we call it quadratic convergence. Um, yes. And now it's really unfortunate that my, that my pen does not work today. I don't know what a random influence um, causes this pen to draw and not to draw. Um, look at the following things. We do have in this formula three times the number two. We have it here, here and here. And this reminds you of what? So the 2 occurs as a square, it occurs as a 1 over 2, and it occurs as a second derivative. This reminds you of what? I would say 2 weeks ago, 3 weeks ago, yeah, Taylor series. Yeah. And I mean this is the Taylor the Taylor formula is so basic and fundamental in mathematics. Um, and this is due to the Taylor expansion. In the Taylor expansion, in the second order term, I have the square x squared, the second derivative occurs, 
and in the denominator we have the 2. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this reminds us of, of uh, Taylor expansion. So if I would ask you to prove this, then you should think maybe it's a good idea to expand our function uh, as a Taylor series. Okay, and, and my, uh, I mean, of course, this also should give you an idea about what happens here. Here we have the power 1, we have a 1 here and the first derivative. So why don't you use the Taylor series and expand it maybe just to the, ter the first order term. And, okay, yeah. So we will in a few minutes uh, prove this using a Taylor series. Okay, but before we prove it, um, we look at the following. We look at this equation. Epsilon k plus 1 is a constant times epsilon k squared. And now we apply the logarithm and let's say we apply the, the log to base 10. Yeah? on the left side and on the right side, and that's what we get. Okay? And now we divide both sides by log epsilon k. Then we get this on the left hand side and this on the right hand side plus 2. Um, yeah, so why is this now about zero, let me see. Yes, so for, for k towards infinity, epsilon k is small. Huh? Epsilon k goes to zero because it converges. If epsilon k goes to zero, then the logarithm of epsilon k goes to minus infinity. And that's in the denominator, so this term is very small. At least small compared to 2. And now we have seen that log epsilon k plus 1 divided by log epsilon k is about 2. What is the and we are talking about small numbers. For example, epsilon k is equal to 0 0.00002. What is the log base 10 of this number? It would be tending to infinity. No. No. I mean, 10 to infinity, that's true, but uh, I want to have a, a better estimate. That's too rough if you say this goes to infinity. The number is very high. What is the, the, the log base 10 of this number? About. It's minus 4. It's minus 4 because we have four zeros after the comma. Huh? Oh no, it's minus, is it? Minus 5. Yeah, because if the 2 were here, it would be minus 1. It's minus 5. Huh? So this is about minus 5. Now let's take epsilon k plus 1 equal to 0. Point So now we have 10 zeros. So now the log is about minus 10. Okay, we have minus 10, minus 5. So the log um, increases by a factor of 2 if the number of digits doubles. Uh, okay? And that's what we have shown here. 
the ratio of the, the logarithms is 2. That means from one step to the next, this is our convergence procedure. The number of correct digits after the comma doubles from one step to the next. That's what's the property of quadratic convergence. Huh? We don't gain one digit per step or even two digits. No, we have an exponential increase of the number of digits behind the comma. So if we have five digits here, ten digits here, then in the next step we have twenty digits. That's extremely fast convergence. Huh? And that's what we get if this assumption holds. And that's the reason why in this example, look here, one, two, three, four, five digits, two, four, six, eight, ten digits. That was exactly the situation here. And so we know that after five steps, we would have 20 digits. Okay, yeah, and now let's prove our theorem 5.9. Yeah. So, but before we start proving this theorem, we should write down the Taylor formula. And, and in order to this, of course, we have to assume that um, f is continuously differentiable up to a sufficient order or, uh, where we develop our, uh, expand our series. And we have to assume that the Taylor series converges. And suppose all these, uh, this holds. Then we have f of x0 plus, um, what is it, the next? Yeah, I mean we get the first derivative f prime of x0 times x minus x0, so this is the first order term, um, plus, and now the second order term, one half times second derivative of x0 times x minus x0 squared plus, and so on. Um, yes. Um, oh, let me see. Do we... Um, yes. I mean, this is if we take the infinite expansion, so the whole Taylor series. But now what we do is we cut our Taylor series after the first order term and the second order term will be the remainder term. How does it look then? Then it's f of x0 uh, plus f prime x0 times x minus x0 plus. And now here we would have the remainder term, r2 of x. Okay. But now we have to look a little bit cl closer. We have seen the Lagrangian form of the remainder term, which is, um, we have these factors, one half times second derivative. And now that's the point. The second derivative now has to be taken at some point c. And this c must be in the interval between x and x0. Yeah? This c is somewhere between these two numbers and we do not know where it is. Times x minus x0 squared. 
Okay. I mean, this is, of course, this is a wonderful, a wonderful thing because now we, uh, we can cut this infinite uh, series here, but, I mean, there is no free lunch. We don't get it for free. Now we don't know this C anymore. But this is good, um, at least for, for finding upper bounds. Yeah. Or I mean, here we we just use it like that. Okay. So now let's take this. And now, what is our what is our expansion point? We are talking about fixed point iteration. This is our function f of x. And now guess. What is the point where we would like to expand f into a Taylor series? Where would you expand f into a Taylor series? The fixed point. The fixed point, yes. I mean, I, I guess that's obvious. Huh? Um, so we take x0 equal to s. Okay, so now we can, uh, we develop yeah, let's, let's write this down. So this is then f of s plus f prime of s times, and now x minus x zero. Um, yes, we take, we take f not at an arbitrary point x, but at xk. So we want to know f of xk. And now, this here, um, this is xk minus x0, okay? And xk minus x0, this is nothing but epsilon, um, yeah, xk, sorry, xk minus s is maybe better. Huh? This is nothing but epsilon k. We defined epsilon k as the, the difference between xk and s. Yeah? Okay, so f of s times x minus x0. x is equal to xk. x0 is equal to s. So we can replace this by epsilon k. Plus and one half times f double prime at this point c times epsilon k squared. Okay, yeah. Um, and now we can look at this slide. So we want to prove theorem 5.9. What is theorem 5.9 again? We want to prove this equation. And what we do is we start computing epsilon k plus 1 and show that this is 1 half times second derivative at s times epsilon k squared. That's what we do. Okay, epsilon k plus 1 is xk plus 1 minus s. xk plus 1 is f of xk, s is f of s, and f of xk is f of s plus epsilon k. Look, f of xk is f of s plus epsilon k. Minus f of s. And now we develop f at this point. Sorry, not develop, that's German. We expand f at this point into a Taylor series at s plus epsilon k. I mean, this is s plus epsilon k. So at xk. And so now we use this formula. We substitute f of s plus epsilon k by our Taylor series, which is f of s, f prime of s times epsilon k plus one half second derivative at C. Okay, so now this is supposed to be our point C. 
Ja. Because of the extension simultaneous series of S plus epsilon k, you want to do, don't, don't you want to make uh, f of x0 the tail expansion f of s? Not you mean you would prefer here to have f of x0 or what? Yes, or the, the expansion, we want to expand the tail series in x0. No. Uh, yes, yes, you're right. I mean, we use as the expansion point x0. That's what we do. We expand our Taylor series in x0, but what we want to have is a function that is um, defined for all x. We, this is, look, this is, um, this right-hand side, which is the Taylor series, is an approximation for f for arbitrary x. But we use as a fixed expansion point x0. So we use x0 as the expansion point, but of course we want to have a function value for arbitrary x. So here we have x0, but here we have an arbitrary x. And that's what we did here. s is our x0, but this is our arbitrary point where we want to evaluate the function. Then we make a Taylor series in the Taylor series again. No, 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 no. No Taylor series in the Taylor series. No. What is your problem? I don't understand it. Um, With the, uh, Fs plus epsilon k. Oh, yeah. uh, S plus epsilon. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, give me a minute and then you will see it. Now, where do we. Ah, let's look at this picture. So this here is our x0, which is the fixed point here. This is our arbitrary point xk, which is s plus epsilon k. Okay, and now that's important. Let's make it with colors. This is our expansion point, which is the fixed point. This is the point where we are now in our iteration, which is an arbitrary point. It may be somewhere. Okay. xk, x0, which is s. Here we have our xk, and this is our fixed point, which is the expansion point. And now here it says this, this number c is between x and x0. Okay? So that means this c here is between what? This um, set is between xk and s. Okay? Now what does that mean? Let's take another color. What does that mean in this picture? That means our point set is somewhere here in between. Okay? It's somewhere in between these two guys. Now if this C is between these two guys, we can write it in the following way. We can write this is um, F double prime of S, this point S, plus Theta times um, epsilon k. For some theta in the interval zero one. This theta is just uh, a scale factor. Yeah? 
if theta is equal to zero, we are here. If theta is equal to one, we are here. And otherwise, somewhere in between. So this is equal to that. And that's why we write it here like that. And you may ask now, why did you do this? Huh? You will see it, <laughs> because we need it now. But before, let's simplify the whole thing. Um, I mean, you see here we have f of s here, and minus f of s, this cancels out. This is equal to zero. And now this is very important too. Look what happens here. The first derivative is zero. Why is it zero? Yeah, because we required it to be zero here. Because we want it to be zero. Now if the first order term is zero in our Taylor series, then the dominant term is the second order term. Look, no, I mean, what's very important, the, the zero order term is zero too. Look, the zero order term cancels out, it vanishes. Then the first order term is zero too. So the dominant term that remains is the second order term. And that's why our convergence now is determined by the second order term. Okay, so what remains is this. For some theta k between 0 and 1. Yes, oh, so this, this uh, theta should get an index k. I mean, we are all, almost finished. You see, we have this one half here, we have the epsilon k squared here, and now we have the second derivative at s plus theta k epsilon k. Um, yes. So what's that here? Yeah, okay. Look, what we do in the next step is we divide left and right hand side by epsilon k squared. And this, of course, is only allowed if epsilon k is not zero. Um, that means, but I mean, during our fixed point iteration, epsilon k always, it may be small, but it's, non, it's not zero all the time. So we can divide by epsilon k squared. And then this is equal to this right-hand side. And now we apply the limit on both sides. Limit k towards infinity of this ratio is equal to one-half of the limit of this term. And now you see why we use this theta k notation. I mean, this theta k is... Um, it is a number between 0 and 1, that's what we know. Uh, that's what we know. And epsilon k, that's what we know too. Because of Banach's fixed point theorem, we know that this iteration converges. That's, uh, and therefore we know epsilon k goes to 0. So this epsilon k here goes to 0. And this is a factor between 0 and 1. So the product is, it cannot be bigger than epsilon k. It can be smaller, which is no problem. Uh, so the limit of this product is of course 0 because um, the limit of epsilon k is 0. Okay, so in the limit, this whole thing is 0 and we are finished. The yeah. question is the x zero on the slide different as on the board? Uh, right, x zero, uh, where do we have x zero? Uh, in a sense, because of there are two x on 
oh, I see, this is not x0, this is x. Oh, what's that? x0 not equal to s, it holds. Oh, I see. Oh, yes, this is an error here. Ah, th this should be xk, of course. xk, thank you. So this is an error in the script. That's interesting. I mean, I used this script at least 20 times. Nobody discovered this error. Okay, um, we have seen now a very nice proof and I hope you learned something about Taylor expansions, um, about Taylor series, about the correspondence between the second power and the second derivative and two factorial, the kth power, the kth derivative, k factorial and this is a pattern that may point you towards the Taylor series. Um, and also a very important principle is um, the higher order terms of the Taylor series, most of the time they are not relevant. But they are extremely important if the leading terms vanish and then some higher order term may be the dominant term and that's what happens here. And now you also know how you can prove convergence formulas of even higher order. I mean, here we have quadratic convergence. Quadratic convergence means, we have just seen it, that the number of digits from one step to the next doubles. Yeah? How can you triple the number of digits? Under what assumption on our function f do we have uh, cubic convergence. Look here, the, the second order term has to, be, has to vanish. Yeah? What does that mean? Yeah, but I mean, what does it mean in terms of our function f? Which functions do have this property? Second derivative zero. Yes, second derivative at the fixed point must be zero. Yeah? The first must be zero and the second too. Yeah? And then we have such a triple order convergence. Of course, I mean, this is quite rare. Find a function that has first derivative zero and second derivative zero at the fixed point. Um, yeah. It's even hard to find a function with first derivative zero at the fixed point. Huh? But that we will see in a minute. We will see that the Newton uh, method does exactly this. The Newton's method transforms an arbitrary function into a function which has this property and that's why Newton's method is extremely fast. Okay, look at, let's look at Newton's method. We start with uh, a, um, a picture you hopefully already know. Um, Newton's method, first of all, is not for finding fixed points. This is not for uh, fixed point uh, equation solving. It is for finding roots of a function. And how does it work? We start with uh, some initial value calculate the function value, then do a linear approximation of our function, which means uh, 
we calculate the tangent, then go to the intersection with the axis, and then uh, repeat the whole thing again. That's Newton's method. This is the formula for the tangent in this point xk. Yeah, it's f of xk plus x minus xk times f prime of xk. You see this is the Taylor expansion to the first order term. That's it. Yeah? That's the tangent. And now let's set... Um, look, what, what did we do here? We define xk plus 1 as the root of the tangent. Okay. Um, so what is, yeah, we set our tangent equal to zero. That's what we do here. And we define x equal xk plus one. Now we take this equation and solve it for xk plus one. And that's what we get, which is the formula for the Newton iteration. And now let's look at this. What do we have here? We have a fixed point iteration again. Look, if you consider this right-hand side as some function of x, then you apply this function to the previous value xk and get xk plus 1. And what is this function? We call it capital F, which is x minus f of x over f prime of x. And now this equation becomes this fixed point equation. xk plus 1 is equal capital F of xk. We just have a simple fixed point equation. But of course, not with our original function f, but with, the, with this new function capital F. And the fixed point of this equation is the root of our original function f. So what you see here is that the Newton's method is nothing but a fixed point iteration with this new modified function. And this is nice, this is nice, because now we can, um, for arbitrary uh, root finding problems, um, we can apply uh, the Newton's method. And the good news is that we have quadratic convergence with the Newton's method. This theorem uh, gives us quadratic convergence of Newton's method. Let's read it. Um, so the assumption is that our function f has to be three times continuously differentiable. Yeah, that's quite a tough assumption, but yeah, we want to have fast convergence. Um, and of course there must be a root of our function, otherwise we can't find one. Um, and the first derivative of f is not allowed to be zero in the whole interval. Um, and the second derivative also. So first and second derivative of f um, cannot be zero. Then there exists an interval around our root s and this root s is the fixed point of capital F. Um, yeah, there exists such an interval 
And on this interval, our new function, capital F, is a contraction. So under these assumptions, this new function, capital F, is a contraction. And that's necessary for convergence of our fixed point iteration. Okay, now if capital F is a contraction, then we can apply Banach's fixed point theorem and we know that uh, this fixed point iterations converges. Yeah? So we have already proven that our fixed point iteration converges by just applying Banach's fixed point theorem. What we have not proven yet is that we even get quadratic convergence. Huh? Okay, let's look at this last theorem. What, did, what do we need for quadratic convergence? We need to prove that the first derivative of our function at the fixed point is zero and that the second derivative is not zero in the fixed point and that the second derivative is continuous. That's what you see here. So what do we need to prove for the Newton's method? We have to show that, and that's all about capital F now, capital F prime at the fixed point has to be zero, capital F double prime is not allowed to be zero and capital F double prime must be continuous. Continuity should be no problem because here we, we require our little f to be three times continuously differentiable. Why three times? Because for capital F we need the same thing two times. And uh, capital F involves the first derivative of our little f, so this is then about the third derivative. Okay, so capital F is two times continuously differentiable. That's what we have already. This should be the first derivative f of s. Part. Where? Here? There's no down in the theorem. In theorem. When the first derivative... No, here, no. Look here for all x in the interval a, b. This must hold. No, this is, this is the fixed point. That's okay. Okay, so what's missing? What, what do we need to prove? We need to prove that um, um, the second derivative of capital F um, is the first derivative is zero, that's what we must do show, and the second derivative is non-zero in the whole interval. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. First derivative of f um, is yeah, it's this. I mean, we just apply the, the ratio formula for the, for the derivative of capital F and that's what we get. Um, and you see here that this here cancels out and together with the one here, uh, this remains. This, this term remains. That's what we get. And now if we replace x by s, we get f of s, which is zero here, and the whole thing becomes zero. So the first derivative of capital F at the fixed point is zero. That's what we have already proven. Yeah? Um, okay, and because of the continuity of uh, f prime, there exists such a delta uh, such that the first derivative of f of x is smaller than some constant smaller than 1 um, around 
the fixed point. Look, at the fixed point, f is 0. And because uh, f prime is 0, and because f prime is continuous, there must be an interval where it's all uh, smaller than 1. This is trivial. OK. So this is easy. And because it is smaller than such a constant l, it is a contraction. And because it is a contraction, um, our um, fixed point iteration converges to the fixed point. Okay, and now about the order of convergence. Um, the first uh, f prime at s is zero, and f double prime, so the second derivative, um, is, I mean, we get this formula, um, and if we now substitute x by the fixed point, we get f of s is zero. So this term, term is zero, this term is zero, what remains is this term. So f double prime at the fixed point is this term, and this cancels out, so we have f double prime of s divided by f prime, of s um, and now you see because how about this what is f prime of s yeah let's look at our assumption yeah f prime in the whole interval is non-zero huh? f double prime at the fixed point is non-zero so we see that this whole thing is not zero. And that's why we have quadratic convergence and not, I mean, if this would be zero, then we would have even higher order convergence. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for today. <laughs>